but we still want AIDS is number one here, and so is sex trafficking. But we still walk around the city like nothing bothers us. Okay. Now, as a person, a human being, to would document and see what's really going on. Election time's coming up. Believe me, I'm in tune with every church in Atlanta, Georgia, Fulton County, Cab County. And some of y'all are going to want to look at me crazy when I say don't, don't vote for him, don't vote for her. Because it's high time. I, I, it's high time to stop playing these little games. Now, when people document and bring up dirt and, re, and release this and that, then don't y'all say nothing. Now, this family is crying and, and begging for justice to be done again in Atlanta, Georgia, Fulton County. And it seems that y'all still don't have a clue that these people are begging for justice. Johnny Hart and the family are begging for justice. Now, we talk about finances. I know, what, I know what meeting this is. The governor and the mayor raised up $50 million for homeless people, and homeless people never got into that money. But we building a cop city. See, those type of things we're getting tired of. And not only that, the legislature makes the votes and it makes the laws. The judicial, legislator, government, the governor, the mayor, it's really more the governor's, it's more the governor's business to take care of homeless than it is the mayor. All right. Thank you, sir. That concludes our public comment. Uh, we now have a quorum. We've been joined by Council Member Dustin Hillis. With that, we're going to go back to the adoption of the agenda. There are two minor changes. We are going to take one communication before our presentation, and then there is a walk-in resolution. Um, but I'll, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Mo moved by Shook, seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. The agenda is adopted. Next item is approval of the minutes. Uh, I think comments or questions? Seeing none, there's a motion from Shook to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The minutes have been approved. All right, colleagues, I'm going to jump to item two under communications. As the appointee is here, it's 23C5111. Communication from Mayor Andre Dickens appointing Mr. M. Russell Wofford, Jr. to serve as a member of the uh, Civil Service Board on behalf of the City of Atlanta. This appointment is for a term of three years. Mr. Wofford, if you'll come up to the podium, just give us a brief inter introduction of yourself and uh, tell us why you'd like to serve in this position. Thank you. Uh, my name is Russ Wofford. I uh, live with my family, wife, and three sons in Atlanta for over 25 years, first in Morningside and now in Ansley Park. I've uh, had some time to open up for me and just wanted to give back to the city that's been very good to my family and to me. Thank you, Mr. Wofford. Any questions or comments? A motion from Shook to approve, seconded by Winston. If there's no further discussion, let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved. Mr. Wofford, thank you. District 6 constituent. Um, and uh, this, will, this paper will move forward to committee on council on Monday. You do not need to be at that meeting or the full council meeting on the 6th. But thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you. All right, colleagues, that takes us back to presentations. Uh, we have two today. First one is Open Records Compliance Act update from Kristen Denius, our chief compliance officer. Ms. Denius, you have the floor. And there is a presentation that uh, you should have a copy of to follow along. Good afternoon, uh, Finance and Executive Committee. <laughs> um, so again, uh, my name is Kristen Denius. I am the city's chief transparency officer. And uh, my main purview in that role is maintaining the city's compliance with the Georgia Open Records Act. So I'm just going to give you an update on what I have been doing in that regard. And obviously, we'll answer any questions that you may have. Uh, one thing I did want to update everybody who uses the city's website to get in touch with me 
is that the um, request open records button moved columns. <laughs> so I didn't want anyone to get lost. You can still get to it um, by clicking on that little bit that I have circled on this slide where it says I want to dot 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 and you will get this drop down menu. The request open records used to be in the column immediately below the red circle, but now it has moved one column to the left where you see the red arrow. So you can still get to me in that way. Um, if you click on that request open records uh, button, it takes you to the my transparency webpage, which has a lot of information about um, requesting open records and how the city complies with the Georgia Open Records Act. It includes um, links to all of our designated open records custodians contact information for each department and it also includes FAQs about the Open Records Act itself and it includes my direct contact information and I invite ev anyone who is listening to me or who gets to this page to please feel free to contact me with any questions that you may have. I actually answer my phone when it rings. Um, the, and and part, the biggest, I think, objective of my role as transparency officer is to avoid any question or any problems or issues with open records compliance at the city before they happen. So I am also interested in hearing if you have already had a bad experience, but my, I'm primarily interested in preventing a bad experience from happening. Um, and we have a lot of people who work at the city of Atlanta and we have a lot of documents that we create. And so occasionally people are not sure where to go to ask for open records and that is a service that I can assist with. So um, these are the, I've got four kind of general updates. Uh, one I just sort of did, which was about the transparency webpage. Um, the second one is around uh, the open records management software that I have been um, working to implement at the city. It, we are so close. We have actually started um, having open records custodians in, our, in various departments start using the software in the, sort of the back of the house way. We need to make sure that each department has at least one person who is comfortable using the software before we are able to open up the public facing portal that goes along with the software because we don't want any open records at requests to go astray. Um, and so when the, when the public facing portal opens up, people will, uh, citizens will be able to submit a request for records through the portal and that portal will direct it to the right place, but we need to know, we need people to know how, what to do with those when they get them. So we are working towards that goal right now. And I just wanna be very clear, the public facing open records portal for the city of Atlanta is not active right now. Some, it exists, but it is not active and it is not connected to anybody in some kind of way, like, Seven people in the world have found this on the internet somehow and it has caused them to be very confused about why things have not gotten handled and I have literally gone in there and put an alert at the top of the page that says this page is not active. Email me if you have a question. So that's how I know that's happening. Um, so when it is active, I am going to show up possibly with balloons, maybe noisemakers, it will be very obvious that the public facing portal is open. It is not yet active. Okay, so um, as part of my quarterly update, I do like to um, highlight an aspect of our open records compliance process uh, so that people are aware of how it works. Last uh, time I did this update, I talked about the email search protocol and today I'm going to just briefly give you some information about how people identify the proper custodian of public records when they want to make a request. So the reason that this is important is because the Open Records Act allows the custodian of a public agency, like us, to designate custodians of public records. And when we do that, which we have done by code, um, uh, an Open Records Act request is not legally considered to be, have been received by the City of Atlanta until it gets to the proper custodian. At the City of Atlanta, each department is the custodian of its own records, and each department has a designated Open Records Officer for that department that is designated to receive all of the records requests for records within their custody. People want, may think, how am I supposed to know who is the Open Records Act custodian for any department? If you go to the transparency webpage that I talked to, showed everybody how to get to earlier, 
you'll see this language that's on the slide um, very close to the top, very close to the picture, right underneath the picture of my face. Um, and there is a hyperlink where you see it says, please direct your records request to the appropriate designated custodian for each city department as listed here. That word here in all caps is a hyperlink and it takes you to a fully searchable uh, listing of all of the open records custodians for each department. So you'll see in this on this particular slide, I typed in the word city and the search populates all of the departments that have the word city in it. So city council, city planning, and the various other subdivisions of city planning. And all of the contact information for the designated open records custodians is available there. Each department has its own shared uh, email inbox that is monitored by, by staff who are trained to handle open records at requests. And the, that's where that email, the e you can send an email to that address and it will be received properly by the department. There's also um, an e-fax and a phone number associated with each department as well. If you ever have any difficulty in either figuring out what department is the custodian of your records or in getting your email to go through or a phone call to go through, I uh, suggest that people call, the website suggests that people contact me directly and I can facilitate that connection if necessary. Every once in a while, um, the system performs upgrades or the system does something else that I don't know what it is and emails will bounce out. That is usually a temporary situation. If I'm aware of it, I can forward it directly to the person who needs to have it and then we can unwind whatever the problem may be. So I am always a resource to citizens and internal clients um, to figure out where the appropriate custodian of a public record might be. So with that, does anybody have any questions? All right, we've, uh, we've also been joined, we were joined by Council Member Matt Westmoreland, who's vanished again, but um, any questions for Ms. Dennis? I have a couple. Um, I, you mentioned about, uh, and you may have uh, said this in your presentation, but um, needing to reach the right custodian. custodian. Um, are there, I guess folks are being, the, the custodians for each departments are trained or know how to notify the person, the inquirer, that they have reached the wrong one so that it's not stuck in a black hole with the user thinking they've gotten to the right person when they actually haven't. Yeah, absolutely. So if someone were to send an email to one of the open records email inboxes and to a department that is not the custodian of the records they're seeking, they should receive a response as required by law within three business days telling them that the custodian that they've reached is not the proper custodian and directing them to the proper custodian if, the, if it is known. Um, if somebody does not know where the, who the, the correct custodian is, I, I have asked them all to, to direct the person to me. Okay, thank you. Um, and then do you have, you talked about that where the, the public facing portal is not open. Um, any projection as to when it will be open? Um, I, my goal is as soon as practically possible um, and, and hopefully before the end of the first quarter of next year. I, if it comes, if it gets, if it's sooner than that, then I will be very happy and to let everybody know, but I'm trying to be realistic because my overarching goal is that we not break the process that we currently have in order to achieve a better one. Um, and final question, I, any trends, any findings or things you've noticed since the last time we presented in terms of the requests and types of requests we're getting? We continue to get a very high volume of requests related to issues that are of, are of any public uh, interest at the city. And I'm sure you can tick them all off in, in your own minds. Um, and so that has not changed. Um, email, requesting emails is um, a very popular form of open records at request. Um, so that is a, a large volume of what I personally see um, or, or am asked to assist with to make sure that the process is running smoothly. Because um, I sometimes feel like you may be the first harbinger of what waves may, not you, but the system and those requests may be the first harbinger of things we should be aware of. So when I do open records training for the officers that are designated in each department, I actually tell them that. So the overarching requirement of the Open Records Act is that we provide access to public records when they are requested. 
and we are not allowed to care why people are asking for records. If they're public, they are entitled to them. And that is the direction that all of our open records custodians are given. However, at the same time, I do tell them that if you receive a request that you believe is related to something that's sensitive or is alarming in some way or an indi indicative of something that the city of Atlanta or your chain of command or your, your leadership in your department needs to know about, then you should always alert folks. And so that is what, the, it's kind of a two-pronged message. We cannot delay right. the provision of the public records because they're public, but we can also be alerted if we need to be alerted. Um, that's all I have. We've also been joined by Marcy Collier Overstreet. Um, any other questions for Ms. Denius? All right, well, thank you for the presentation. And good luck with the public portal. Open Thank you. Portal. All right, next up is Invest Atlanta. Uh, I saw Dr. Clementich in the back. Uh, I see them walking up. Uh, colleagues, again, you have a copy of the presentation to follow. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Eloisa Clementich, proud president and CEO of Invest Atlanta. And this will be a team effort today. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's start with our tax allocation districts, and I will turn it off to, over to Jennifer Fine, and then followed by Nino Chapetta, the CFO for Invest Atlanta. Jennifer. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as I do each quarter, I'm going to run through some programmatic activity um, so far in 2023 through August of this year. Um, and for viewers who might be unfamiliar with the city's TADS, this map shows their locations throughout the city. Very important to note here that as of June 2023, Princeton Lakes TAD has been dissolved. That is the first one um, in the city of Atlanta. Um, so happy to report that. Um, so all remaining available tax increment uh, was sent back to the taxing jurisdictions, in this case, the city and the county, and all property tax collection from now on will go directly to the city and the county, just like in areas outside of the TADS. So this slide, slide provides an overview of project approvals in 2023, again, through August. Um, we have approved 10 projects in four TADs, representing a wide diversity of project types and location. $11 million has been awarded, uh, which has then leveraged $141 million in private development um, investment in the city of Atlanta. These projects represent construction of just about 400 total housing units, of which 335 um, will be affordable at area median incomes ranging from 30 to 80 percent. Um, TAD funding will also be used to reactivate and improve long vacant commercial buildings to provide much needed community oriented <coughs> services, uh, community space and retail, particularly in disinvested neighborhoods. This map, uh, just a general overview again of location of where these projects are. Um, and as I say all the time, very proud of the range of project types, big and small, different uses, but then also um, location throughout the city. Uh, so far this year, as you can see in the map, we've seen a lot of activity in the Perry Bolton and um, Eastside Tads, in particular, the Sweet Auburn neighborhood. Um, this table is uh, kind of a takeaway handout uh, I like to provide that gives a bit more detail on all 10 of those projects. Um, square footage detail, funding detail, uh, approval detail as well. So the next three slides will give you a visual perspective on a few of the projects um, that are in that table. Uh, images on the top are of the Centerwell Senior Primary Care Facility uh, that had its grand opening just this past July. Uh, $750,000 Perry Bolton TAD grant was awarded to completely renovate a building that had been vacant for decades on Donald Lee Hollowell primary commercial corridor. It's now a much needed community resource providing critical care to seniors. Um, the bottom image is the historic Odd Fellows building in Sweet Auburn neighborhood. Um, it will be renovated to be the home of Georgia Works, a nonprofit serving chronically homeless men. 
um, in a residential setting while they um, are transitioning to stable housing and employment. That received a $1.25 million Eastside TAD grant. Image on the top is another historic uh, property and project we're proud to be supportive of. That's the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge, <clears throat> also in Sweet Auburn. It was awarded a $250,000 pre-development loan, as well as a $1.5 million Eastside TAD grant uh, to do a wholesale renovation of the 16,000 square foot space. Um, it'll be multi-use space, including retail office, uh, office to the National Park Service, which will operate an educational and interpretive exhibit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s SCLC office. Um, and the bottom image shows phase one of a single family project in the Cary Park neighborhood in the Perry Bolton Tad. $1.5 million grant will be used to help create 20 affordable for sale single family homes, uh, 10 of which will be permanently affordable uh, through a partnership with the Community Land Trust. And then the last images I have show the Inglewood Senior Development in the Chosewood neighborhood in South Atlanta. It will create 160 units of affordable housing at no more than 60% of area median income. And permanent, permanent affordability will be possible through ownership um, and a long-term uh, ground lease with Atlanta Housing. Uh, so very, very significant project um, for lots of different reasons. And then my next, my last three slides really are just to provide you with um, some financial overview. Uh, the first one shows overall growth of assessed value in the TADs um, from inception. First TAD was, Westside TAD was created in 1992 um, to current. So you can see um, from the beginning, assessed value rose from $1.4 billion to currently about Eight point eight point seven billion. Uh, it's about a thirteen percent cumulative increase. So the TADs are definitely performing how we want them to perform. This slide shows the percentage of assessed value within each TAD, and it's really important to understand this data as it it impacts the city's ability to create or alter um, create new TADs or alter TADs due to that ten percent rule of the Georgia um, Redevelopment Powers Law, which says that no more than 10% of a jurisdiction's assessed value can be within TADs. And in this case, the value of the TADs in the city of Atlanta is about 19%, which is great. Again, it gets at the performance of the TADs. And so we're perfectly fine at that percentage. It just means city can't create any new TADs until um, that number were to come back down uh, to 10%. So TADs would have to close, obviously, um, and we just reported on the first one of those in Princeton Lakes. And then the last slide I will leave you with um, is really a snapshot of tax increment that was collected in fiscal year 2023. Um, this is kind of gross collections before debt and other obligations are paid. Just important for you to understand um, you know, what was collected and, and how they're performing. And now Nino, our, our chief financial officer, will talk about bond uh, debt in Centennial Yards. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so the West Side TAD uh, Series 2021 Gulch bonds, the current outstanding principal balance is 24.9 million. And the Downtown Development Authority Series 2021 Gulch bonds, uh, the current outstanding principal balance is 100,000. And now I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Clementich. I just wanted to provide an update on our commercial property assessment. Again, thank uh, the city council and the mayor for their uh, continual focus on what it is energy efficiency throughout the city. So for central, for CPACE, just as a reminder, this is commercial PACE. It allows for basically 30 year fixed rate, uh, low, in low interest loans to be able to provide commercial owners with upgrades to their buildings for energy efficiency programs. On Tuesday of next week, we expect to be going through the bond validation process. And probably following that next week, we will be open 
Well, we already are open for applications, but as soon as we get the current eight applications in the pipeline and the other eight that are in some process of their application, we'll begin to process those. Just as a quick reminder, what we did different, and thanks to you, is we're going to an open market, meaning that any, any commercial owner can bring their own financing to this deal. We've already approved eight financing entities for the CPACE program. So we're excited about this has no impact to Investlana, no impact to the city. It really is private financing, but makes more feasible, and especially in this environment, to finance energy efficiency upgrades throughout the city. And um, with that, I just open it up to any questions you will have of myself or anyone on the team. All right, questions for um, Dr. Clementich. I have a couple. I'll go ahead and launch, and then it might spark some questions for. Um, I want to start with the TAD um, information. Um, so Princeton Lakes dissolved 2023, um, spun off the increment in 2023 about two million dollars. I'm assuming that's still part of the TAD financing. When when does the that increment start going back to the participating jurisdictions? Yes, it already started going back to the jurisdictions on June 30th. Okay. All right. Um, and it is, is it, what was the participation percentage? Is it the same as kind of property, about the same percentage as property taxes, 50, 25, 25? So in Princeton Lakes, the taxing jurisdictions, there's only two taxing only jurisdictions, two, right. city and county, so 50-50. Yeah. And when the, when the TAD was dissolved, there was about $2 million of increment that, so 1 million, 1 million approximately sent to the city, sent to the county. And then all increment now goes to the taxing jurisdictions again, just like everywhere. And, what's, and that two million, just to confirm, was what was generated in the year. It wasn't just, it wasn't accrued increment, correct? It, it was. It, well, okay. it was available increment that wasn't needed to pay off the remaining loan and accrued increment, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, second question I had, had, had to do, has to do with the um, Centennial Yards project. I think we had talked about um, I wasn't here when that transaction was done, but I did understand that there was um, some funding that was provided for um, the city to do some other um, initiatives. So I wanted to get an update on that um, as to where we are, balances, and all that fun stuff. Yes. So there are a couple. So the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, the commitment CIM would pay would be $29 million. If you recall, this, well, the city council approved us getting some of those funds up front, so through a net present value. So what we actually got was $20.9 million in an affordable housing trust fund, of which we've received $10 million for an anti-displacement, $4.5 million down payment assistance, and $6.4 million in public land. And I'll make sure to send you this updated graph as well. Okay. Um, it is just, it, for the record, this graph is also on our CDHS presentation. I think the one in our finance one doesn't have the amount of detail I put in here. So I'll send you the, this one. It's much clearer. Okay. On the on-site affordable housing, uh, 200 residential units at 20% of the total resident units at Centennial Yards needed to be for affordable housing of 99 years. Currently, we have 28 affordable housing units at Centennial Loft, which is that old Norfolk Southern building. The Economic Development Fund, uh, CIM paid or committed to 12 million, but then because of the legislation on the net present value, we got 10.7 million. That 10.7 million, 4.1 million went to local hire. 2 million went to an income pilot at the city, 2 million for the child savings at the city, and 2.75 million for the small business innovation hubs. And then the APD mini precinct is pending, the office space for economic development is pending, security enhancements are in progress, the Nelson Street Bridge is complete, the fire station is pending until the project obviously. Carry Still Honor is complete. In terms of the Workforce Development Implementation Plan, CM will donate $2 million or a net present value of 1.7. All of those funds have been sent to the Atlanta Technical College, who's using those funds to create a center that will provide um, license for commercial uh, driver's license. 
And then the Eco Business Opportunity EBO plan, CIM reports, well, they committed to 38% of util utilization and they are reporting 39.8 million. So it sounds like aside from the I mean, 39.8%, not million. So aside from just the project, the construction projects um, and the spaces and the facilities, everything else has been kind of either drawn because of, via net present value or um, expended and committed, right? Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions for Dr. Clementich? Yeah, she mentioned it, but go ahead. Uh, Councilmember Hillis. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, some more clarity around the fire station. I know it says it's in progress. What's the more in-depth? I think until they get further along in their project, there will be discussions about the fire station because they had said they were going to put it. The last time I saw it on top of one of the the constructions they're going to build up, you know how they're going to raise up the road. So that has not been built out yet. But let me go find out the exact details of when that fire station is going to come online. But that's what I saw in the plan, that it was going to be on the upper level. That hasn't even been started yet. So I don't. Thank but you. I will confirm and get you more details, Council Member. Much appreciated. Mm -hmm. All right, other questions for the Invest Atlanta team? All right, seeing none, thank, thank you, you very much. We appreciate it. All right, I um, just want to make a note that uh, you have received the written copy of the COVID-19 funds report. So if you've had a chance to look at that and have any questions, make sure you reach out to the Finance Department on that. And with that, that concludes our presentations uh, for this meeting. We'll move on to the agenda next agenda item, which is communications. First item is 23C5110, communication from Mayor Andre Dickens, appointing Ms. Delmarie Griffin, Esquire, to serve as a procurement appeals hearing officer on behalf of the city of Atlanta. This appointment is for a term of two years. The appointee was not able to make today's event, uh, today's event meeting. So with that, I'll make a motion to hold, seconded by Westmoreland. Let's open that book. The phone is open. Phone is closed. Six J's, zero nays. Motion carries. Item will be held. Next up is uh, ordinances for first reading. Ms. Lindo, if you will sound uh, the three items before us, please. Here, item. Sorry, my glasses broke. Item number three is 230-1591. This is an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer on behalf of the Department of Aviation to provide payment of one-fourth of the existing accumulated <coughs> hazard pay compensatory, compensatory time awarded during the COVID-19 disaster labeled as accrued time to all COVID-19 designated Department of Aviation mission critical employees and for other purposes. Item number four. It's 230-1592. This is an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor as designee on behalf of the city of Atlanta to execute all documents ne necessary for the acquisition of certain property interests necessary for the South Downtown pedestrian en enhancement, authorizing negotiations with property owners for the acquisition of such property interests, authorizing title searches, appraisals, surveys, and any other items necessary for the acquisition of such property interests, authorizing the mayor and the city attorney in the event in the event of negotiations are unsuccessful to institute condemnation proceedings pursuant to Georgia section listed herein, waiving certain subsections of section 2-1541 and 2-1545 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances on behalf of the Atlanta Department of Transportation, all contracted work and payments for property list interest to be paid from accounts numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Item number five is 230 1593 this is an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee on behalf of the Atlanta Department of Transportation to amend Ordinance 19-0-1634, adopted by the Atlanta City Council on July 1st, 2019, and approved by the mayor on July 19, 2019, by adding a new community development block grant funding account and authorizing the chief finance chief procurement officer to issue purchase orders under community development block grant agreement all other parts of the legislation to remain unchanged and for other purposes all right we will have those before us next cycle and dispense with them then next up ordinances for second reading first item is 230-1558 ordinance by finance executive committee to amend the city of atlanta code of ordinances part three land development code appendix e atlanta housing code of 1987 Article 3, Administrative NREM, so as to provide for the levy, collection, and assessment of interest and penalties on liens resulting from the cost of vacating, closing, and or demolition of properties 
determined to be unfit for occupation or habitation and for other purposes. Mr. Davis, you have the floor. Tell us, please tell us about this paper. Good afternoon, Council Lawrence Davis, Jr., Revenue Chief for the Office of Revenue. Um, basically, as stated, we are uh, requesting to allow us to impose the um, interest and penalties. Uh, the interest and penalties are, will coincide with the way it is uh, done for unpaid uh, revenue, unpaid real estate property with the counties, and that is a 0.875% per month plus a 1% for every uh, um, 1,000. Right, questions? That's, question for <clears throat> Mr. Davis. Mr. Hillis. Thank you, Chairman Juan. Um, I'd like to request just a... Uh, accounting uh, of the account that uh, those collected revenues go into uh, when those liens are collected upon um, and a uh, just really a, I guess a balance sheet over the past year of expenditures or transfers out of that account yes sir thank you other questions motion from shook to approve is there a second seconded by Collier Overstreet let's open that vote please the vote is open The vote's closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved. Next item, 2301559, an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee to amend Ordinance 2301370, adopted by the Atlanta City Council on August 21, 2023, and approved as per City Charter Section 2403 on August 30, 2023, to amend the account information and for other purposes. Are there any questions for Mr. Davis on this? It's just account update. Motion from Shook to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved. Thank you. Next item, 2301572. There is a substitute that changes the caption. It's a, a substitute ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $10,000 and zero cents to the Atlanta Pride Committee on behalf of the Atlanta City Council to support the 2023 Atlanta Pride Festival and for other purposes. Uh, substitute changes the amount and adds other council member contributions. I'll make the motion to bring the substitute forward. Seconded by Shook. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. Votes closed. Six J's, zero nays. Motion carries. Substitutes before us. Any other discussion on this? Motion from Shook. Seconded by Winston. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J zero. No, I, no, I just assumed. It's terrible. <laughs> six six J zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved on substitute. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to take items nine and ten as a block. If there's no objection, twenty three o fifteen seventy four, or. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed 8000 Nope, wrong one. Ordinance by Councilmember Matt Westmoreland authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $1,000.00 from the post two at large carry forward account to the Atlanta Preservation Center and for other purposes. And 2301577, ordinance by Councilmember Alex Wan authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $1,750.00 to the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Atlanta from the Council President Carry Forward account to support the diversion, Diversity and Inclusion Gala and for other purposes. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve both. Is there a second? Okay. Seconded by Collier Overstreet. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. Motion carries. Uh, I, um, both items are approved. All right. I'm. Item number 11, uh, there is a substitute that changes the, or adds an additional amount. It is 2301581, an ordinance by Councilmember Amir Faroki is substituted by Finance Executive Committee authorizing a payment to Purpose Possible LLC in an amount not to exceed $31,000.00 for the District 2 Arts and Culture Plan, authorizing the transfer of $80,000.00 from the District 2 Carry Forward account to the District 2 Expense account and for other purposes. I'll move to bring that substitute forward, seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote, please. 
The vote is open. The vote's closed. Six J, zero nay, substitutes before us. I'll move to approve on substitute. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Six J, zero nays, motion carries. Item is approved on substitute. All right, uh, colleagues, I'm gonna jump to item 50 uh, while we have Ms. Kempson right here for that. Um, there is a substitute for this. It's 23-0-15-49. This is an ordinance by Council Member Alex Wan is substituted by Finance Executive Committee amending the fiscal year 24 general fund budget by transferring to and from appropriations an amount not to exceed $1,163,673.31 from the Council President and Council Member carry forward accounts with a net amount of $1,159,026.70 to be returned to the Council President and Council Member carry forward accounts for the true up of the fiscal year 2024 carry forward balances and for other purposes. I'll move to bring the substitute forward. Second. Seconded by Shook. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Six J's, zero nays, motion carries the substitutes before us. Ms. Kempson, right, you have the floor. Um, yes, um, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chair and committee members, Santana Kempson, right, council staff director. This item authorized the fiscal year 24 true up. Um, to the council president and council member carry forward accounts based on residual um, amounts left over in fiscal year 23 after the um, financial audit concluded. Any questions? Motion, motion from Shook to approve on substitute, seconded by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays, motion carries. The Thank item you. is approved on substitute. All right, that takes us back to item 12, 23 ordinance by council members Jason Dozier and Oleana Bakhtiari to amend ordinance 23 adopted by the city council on March 6, 2023 and approved by operation of law on March 15, 2023, authorizing the contribution of a total amount not to exceed $2,800,000.00 to park pride to support green space improvements and upgrades in communities across Atlanta to correct the funding account numbers for the District 5 contribution and for other purposes. Uh, this is simply a account change. Um, motion by Shook, seconded by Westmoreland. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved. Or, yes, that's correct. All right, that takes us to resolutions. First item up is 23R 4251. Resolution by Council Member Andrea L. Boone is substituted by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute contractual agreements for RFP listed employee benefits 2024 with A, Anthem for self-insured medical and drug, B, Kaiser Permanente for fully insured medical and drug, C, United Healthcare for Medicare Advantage Prescription Drugs Plan 1, D, United Healthcare for Medicare Advantage Prescription Drugs Plans 2 and 3, E, Kaiser Permanente for Medicare Advantage Prescription Drugs Plan 4, F, Cigna for Dental Self-Insured DPPO Plan, G, United Healthcare for Dental Fully Insured DHMO Plan, H, United Healthcare for Vision Plan, I, Anthem for Life AD and D Insurances, J, Aflac for Individual Short-Term Disability, K, Cigna for Group and Accident Insurance, Critical Illness and Hospital Indemnity Plans, L, Anthem for FSA, Healthcare and Dependent Care, and M, Anthem for COBRA and Retiree Billing on behalf of the Department of Human Resources for a term of three years with two one-year renewal options beginning January 1, 2024 through December 31, 2027 in an amount not to exceed $594,752,287.12 to be paid from accounts listed and for other purposes. Colleagues, the first thing we need to do is to amend this to attach the IPRO report. I'll make that motion to amend, seconded by Collier Overstreet. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. All right, six yeas, zero nays. Uh, the amended paper is now before us. So now I'm going to invite uh, the HR Commissioner Smith to the podium uh, to walk us through this and the actions that she, uh, she is recommending that we take. And there is a presentation for this as well. Good afternoon, Chairman One and Committee. Thank you. Tarlisha William-Smith, THR Commissioner for the City of Atlanta. 
Um, I also have standing with me a director of health and benefits for the HR department, Mr. Michael Nathaniel. We are coming before you today to ask for approval for an extension of our current benefits plan. Uh, we're asking for this extension because after going out through the RFP process and without going into information that's uh, protected by the blackout period, we needed to be able to um, handle the back office and that means the implementation of the benefits and being able to do that with our current software conversion and migration, we needed to ask for the extension. The extension, um, I will go through the, um, the overview that I have here, the presentation, but basically the extension will ensure the continuity of coverage for all of our employees, 8,500 plus, uh, through uh, next year, uh, December, 20, December 31, 2024. All right, so if I understand you correctly, well, um, well were you gonna go on with your presentation or do you want? Uh, I, I can, I'm waiting for the chair. No, 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 please. Um, well, colleagues, I think um, procedurally, what we're gonna need to do, end up, end up doing is holding this paper and then um, there is a re resolution that's being walked in today. Um, but I think, do you wanna go through your presentation then we can take those actions afterwards. Why don't we do that? Uh, that's fine. And the, basically the presentation is just an overview of the enhanced benefits that are not going to create any fiscal impact or um, amendment to the contract. Okay, let's go ahead and do that and then okay. we can take our actions. So basically um, it's just an overview there. Oh, we did, oh, I'm clicking. Okay, this benefits benchmark. This is basically a brief agenda of what we're gonna discuss today. Uh, here, I just basically wanna highlight that we have 8,200 active employees and about 7,100 retirees that are dependent upon the uh, current insurance coverage that we have and where we seek the approval today for medical, dental, vision, and life uh, insurance plans uh, provided by the city. And below you see um, many of the initiatives that were initiated throughout this year. Um, basically, we have the, the the new agreement that we were able to procure with uh, Everside, we sealed the deal there. We, with the fitness center, we were able to finalize the contract with Aquila. Uh, the juice bar is now open, I believe I mentioned that in the last FEC. Uh, we had the kickoff and, the, uh, and there was also a conference by the Public Safety Behavioral Health and Wellness Unit that has been established by uh, Dr. Carla Moore with the partnership with uh, police, fire, and corrections chiefs. Uh, we have EAP that's now not necessarily relocated, but uh, I guess they're operating out of Ted Turner right now. So we have our regular EAP services for our employees, and we also have specific and directed uh, EAP services and wellness services, which are more preventative than ongoing for our public safety departments, where we have clinicians sitting in all three departments. Um, and basically we have some uh, citywide wellness initiatives. We have our DHR showcase coming online. I believe uh, if everything is approved today, November 17th is the proposed date for us to begin and it will go on for about 13 days. There are some other initiatives that we'd like to discuss that'll come up uh, later on in this presentation regarding the non-usage of uh, health benefits by some of our employees. And one group is about 10.4% and the other group is about 7.4. So we will have targeted initiatives to make sure that our employees are accessing their health benefits and going to the doctor and getting their baseline screenings. Challenges and trends. Um, we did have a bit of a claims history uh, coming out of the pandemic because we all know that many people were not able to go to the doctor or uh, attend physicians and do baseline uh, assessments and evaluations during the pandemic. So we are experiencing a little bit of a, a higher claims uh, volume since that time. So many of the numbers that you'll see coming forward will come out of that. So we wanna make sure that um, employees are ac actually accessing their benefits as a result of not being able to go for the past couple of years. And many of the uh, things here we've discussed probably ad nauseum over the last few. Okay. Over the last few FEC meetings, we're having discussions about benefits plans or even our initiatives associated with the Wellness Center. And basically the goal is saturation for more utilization of not only our Wellness Center, but also to make sure that our employees are accessing the benefits that they're paying for and that the city's subsidizing. Cost contribution and salary uh, strategy changes. The ask today does not necessarily, uh, well, will not have any fiscal impact. There's no 
impact to the actual employees. The ask today is as actually going to be um, a cost, and I can uh, turn it over to Chief Bala that will, if he's prepared to discuss it at this point or this juncture, um, there is no impact to the employee cost for benefits with the ask that we have today before count, uh, council and committee. There is no rate increase, and we also were able to secure um, open access without impacting the contract as well. So employees who employees and retirees who need to access benefits who don't necessarily live in the state of Georgia, but have access to a a network in network services for from the providers anywhere in the country, they're now able to access that without any additional cost. And there's also the opportunity for them to. Um, access specialists and have specialist visits at no addition um, without a referral so basically it's an open network access at this point uh, which is different than what we had before which is a great benefit to many of those who don't live in the uh, metro atlanta area and the retirees who have since uh, retired and moved on so they can have access where they are these are our current carriers of whom we're speaking right now. Again, uh, with the vendors and uh, the benefits that we're asking for today for approval, there are no plan changes, no rate changes from 2023 moving forward to 2024. And this is the rate summary and comparison for each uh, particular plan and carrier. additional rate summaries. Same, same. <laughs> These are all rate summaries. Yes, uh, with a, I think total of nine providers are, those are all of the summaries which you will have time to review. This speaks to the claim history that um, we discussed earlier in terms of what has happened over the past two years with our employees, some of them accessing or not accessing, but the trend over the last uh, couple of years moving forward into the 2024 coverage year. Uh, moving forward, again, if we are approved today, we will proceed with open enrollment. It will be delayed by approximately maybe one week, but we intend on having open enrollment for all employees, retirees, during, uh, well, beginning on November 17th and uh, going through I believe it's a 13 day period for all active and retired employees. Uh, because it would be an extension of the current contract, we would be asking for a passive enrollment, meaning that anyone who does, any employee who do, or retiree who does not have any changes does not have to access the system. Everything would automatically roll over. However, if there are any changes, they would have to access the system, come down to our showcases or catch one of the road shows, speak to one of our representatives to be able to make those changes. And again, important reminders during open enrollment, review your current information, review your new information for the upcoming plan year, and definitely update your life insurance beneficiaries. The next page is our, if the clicker will work for me. The retiree, did we take that one out? The retiree medical rates are there as well. And again, the cost for all the active and retired employees will remain the same. This is all inf open enrollment information that we've already shared with you. Again, here, I think it's important to park for a second to let uh, the leadership know, as well as the employees who are listening, that 10.4% are non-utilizing members. That means that they have not gone to the doctor or seen any of the providers that are listed or that are currently covering our city employees. That's a high number for us, um, looking from the HR space, as well as the, uh, that's for Kaiser Permanente and for Anthem at 7.6. Um, that may be good for some people, but it's not necessarily good for us. <laughs> From a financial standpoint, it's great for claims history, but for us, we're more concerned about employees accessing those benefits and making sure that they get baseline assessments and we can detect any challenges or illnesses that they have. Uh, to the left of the 10.4 non-utilizing members, we see uh, the trend of the highest number of claims in those areas, circulatory heart disease, cancer, and injuries. 
if we're trending um, like that in those particular areas and have that much non-utilization, it kind of frightens me to know what could be happening with somebody if they're not going to the doctor. So this is going to be our plea, and uh, I've also spoken to Mr. Nathaniel about making a targeted um, campaign towards those employees. We will send letters out to them specifically to let them know that, you know, we understand that you're not using your benefits and we want to let you know why it's a good reason to do so. Because you're paying for it, not be just because you're paying for it, but you need to get your baseline assessments. Uh, these are initiatives that we normally do um, on an annual basis regarding the mammograms, healthy heart events, promotions, and these are all uh, initiatives that um, Mr. Naftaniel and his team take on as well as um, the road shows that go to the various departments educating our employees on the different services and um, events that we have as far as wellness and fitness. And Taylor, Taylor Booker? Taylor Booker is our new wellness coordinator. She's not too new, but she's, I'm not sure she's in the room. Yeah, she's in the room. Taylor um, oversees our, uh, the fitness center as well as uh, under the direction of Mr. Neff Daniel, the um, wellness center. And they have several initiatives that are uh, moving forward for our employee work groups. That's it, questions. All right, with that, I'll, I'll entertain questions for the commissioner. Um, and we've also been joined by council member Liliana Bakhtiari. Good afternoon. Y'all don't, I'm going to, do you want, I'm going to jump in with a couple of them. Number one is um, the passive enrollment process. How is that going to be communicated to our, our staff members or our team employees? Um, we have, well, a few ways. Um, we have the actual DHR showcase where all of the vendors are required to come forward and be downstairs to, for Q&As and share information with our employees. We have road shows that Mr. Nafta Angel takes uh, the entire team around the city for those who can't come to City Hall to get questions answered. We have staff um, every day who will be ready and available to assist all of our employees um, with their passive enrollment and of course saturation via um, all of our mediums uh, in the city and social media. Do you want to say anything like yeah. that? Yeah, and we, we also and do. Identify yourself real quick before you start. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Michael Neftaniel, Direct Employee Benefits Director. Good afternoon. Um, we also are, have a campaign where we'll send uh, newsletters and flyers to homes in, the, in addition to our email, standard email campaign. Yeah. I just want to make sure that it's not yes. just the people who happen to be tuned in today to hear all this. That they'll get a communication yes. electronic or, or yes. physical. Um, the other, a couple things. I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying is that because we're simply extending our current vendors, that if you have no changes, you don't need to do anything. With the exception, I'm seeing here of the, uh, the flexible spending account matter that that you do have to come in and renew. Correct. Okay. Just want to make sure that that gets uh, um, shared out with with everybody as well, because that there are all, I know a lot of folks are in, enrolled in that. I'm kind of curious as to why the claims dollar amounts are trending downward and including this year I feel like you opened earlier with that the pandemic actually made change people's habits that made things potentially worse or not uh, unhealthier I should say not worse but so walk me through why we're seeing the opposite happen with our claims so in 2020 Two, it looked like uh, a lot of uh, the employees and the participants didn't utilize, and a lot, most employers are over the nation are seeing that they didn't utilize services. Mm -hmm. And now coming into 2023, when things are opened up and things, people are coming back, those utilization stats go higher. In addition, the shortages in healthcare <laughs> that we hear about in the news every day, <laughs> the, the providers, the, okay. the supply chain, all of those factors go into the mix there. Wow, okay, yeah. that's kind of a... Yeah. It's an interesting convergence there. Yes. Um, and I, I you're right. It could yeah. create a more potentially dangerous situation for folks. Correct. Um, so I appreciate the, the yeah. initiatives that y'all are taking. Okay. Um, other questions um, for uh, the commissioner? Councilmember Shook. So 10.4% uh, non utilizing members. What, what might that number more typically look like for a municipal government? Utilization rate? Yeah. Yes. So I, you think it's high? Yeah, I, I think that number is high. I mean, anything above three or four percent for me is high. That means that, you know, if we're talking about ten percent of that plan, that's over seven or eight hundred people. 
in that particular plan, that's a lot. It's nearly a thousand and employees that, that are not accessed. How's that trending over the last couple of years? I only we only looked at it for this one. I, I can give that information back to you, okay. Mr. Shirk. Um, so for this transaction to have occurred on its original timetable, what would have needed to happen? Uh, we would have needed the back office assistance of the transition transition of our current system. Uh, without speaking to the RFP, we needed to be able to have the infrastructure in place to do a test run for payroll uh, benefits and make sure everything was in alignment for a payroll on the last uh, for the last payroll run of December. And we're just not infrastructurally in a position to be able to do that right now between our technology, the new vendors that uh, may be coming on, and uh, the back office work that needs to be done for the testing. So is there any new or upgraded technology we needed on our end that we haven't already procured? Uh, no, we actually have it. We just have to make it talk to each other and test it. Other questions? Okay, so let me make sure I get this correct. The paper that I just read in is actually for the benefits. It's the shell paper for the benefits that'll take an effect January 1, 2025. So what we need to do with that one now is hold it. Correct? Yes. All right, so I'll make the motion to hold. Need a second, please. Seconded by Collier Overstreet. Um, let's open that vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J zero nays. Motion carries. That item is held. And the timetable on that is at some point in in the near future, you will come back and essentially present what uh, the program will look like in January 2021 with plenty of time for us to, you, you know, the uh, implementation piece so that we'll be ready for open enrollment and that in fall of next year. That's correct. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and now take care of um, the extension piece and colleagues. That is the walk-in legislation that um, I mentioned earlier. It's Elms ID 33918. A resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute amendment number three for employee benefits agreement FC 10389 with A, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia, Inc. for group health insurance, um, POS, HDHP, Medicare Advantage Insurance, PPO, Life Insurance, Dental Insurance, PPO, Dental and Administration of Flexible Spending, B, Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of Georgia, Inc. for group health insurance, HMO, D, HDHP, and Senior Medicare Advantage Insurance, HMO. C, United Healthcare Insurance Company for Medicare Advantage Insurance, PPO, and Voluntary Vision Insurance. D, Aetna Life Insurance, Inc. for Dental Insurance, DHMO. E, Met Life Insurance for Voluntary Benefits. And F, American Family Life Assurance Company of Columbus, Inc. for Short-Term Disability. By extending the agreement from January 1st, 2024, for a period not to exceed 12 months, on behalf of the Department of Human Resources, in an amount not to exceed $175,233,000, $750.00 to be charged to and paid from accounts listed herein and for other purposes. Um, I do have a quick question on this. It's a finance question. The rate on this, the $175 million, how does it compare to what we are paying for 2023? So, you know, 2023, it's a uh, slight... You need to identify yourself. Yeah. Hello, Mohammed Bala, Chief Financial Officer. So it is a slight uh, increase from... Uh, 2023, most of the proponents kept the rates flat, with the exception of a few proponents that uh, increased uh, slightly for inflation adjustments, about 5% or so. But net net, it's a little bit, um, uh, if you net it all out, it's probably about half a percent or so increase across the board. That's that's manageable. That's not, does that, does that sound right? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, any other questions? And again, um, even that, those increases or changes are masked from the employees because their their contribution is stays staying the same. flat. Yeah, for so the, the, the net increase will be absorbed right. by the city. And, and we that and one thing to note is going into the FY24 budget year, which contemplates half of this budget, okay. we did anticipate a 6% an, uh, increase. So okay. it's well within those guidelines. We're covered. Yep. All right, uh, I'll make the motion to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Bakhtiari. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee.
All right, uh, we'll continue on with resolutions. Next item up is 23R4353, a resolution by Councilmember Byron D. Amos urging the General General Georgia General Assembly to create and implement the Senior Citizens Living Expense Decree or a Senior Citizen Rent Increase in Exemption for Georgia Senior Citizens and for other purposes. Is there any discussion on this item? Motion from Shook to approve, seconded by Westmoreland. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved. Next item, 23R4359, resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to add additional funds to the retention incentive payment program for 83 Department of Aviation employees <coughs> grade 19 and below, comprising 22 emergency management 911 call center employees and 61 ATL enforcement employees for the fiscal year 2024 aviation revenue fund budget by transferring $500.00 for each employee in an amount not to exceed $41,500.00 to accounts referred to herein and accounts identified by the chief financial officer and for other purposes. Colleagues, this is in the wrong form. It needs to be a resolution, so I'll make the motion to file. I mean, an ordinance, so I'll make the motion to file. Seconded by Bakhtiari. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item will be filed. Next item, 23R4360, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute the second amendment to contract number listed, Everbridge Mass Notification and Emergency Alert System with Everbridge, Inc. On behalf of the Department of Atlanta Information Management, the Department of Customer Service, Atlanta Police Department, the Atlanta City Council, and the Department of Aviation to add the Department of Finance as an authorized user for services under the agreement in an amount not to exceed $5,133.33. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Any questions on this paper? Seeing none, motion from Shook to approve. I'll second it. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved. Next item, 23R4361, resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to exercise the first renewal option for cooperative, purchase, uh, cooperative agreement number listed, IT research and advisory services with Infotech Research Group, Inc., on behalf of the Department of Atlanta Information Management for a term of one year, commencing January 24, 2024, through January 23, 2025, in an amount not to exceed $200,959.71, and to execute the First Amendment to the agreement to add the Departments of Public Works, Watershed Management, and Aviation as authorized users to the agreement. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed herein and for other purposes. Mr. McKinney, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Chairman Wong and honorable members of the committee. Uh, InfoTech has been an excellent partner for us. They're actively engaged in some of our highest priority uh, initiatives internally, uh, from benchmarking our customer service satisfaction to enhancing our staffing strategy to aligning some of our security practices to best practices and continuing to assist us with a number of tools and templates and the like for uh, our, our betterment. So uh, we look forward to continuing to work with them and with your approval, we will. So, thank you. Uh, any questions? Motion from Westmoreland, is there a second? From Winston, let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved. Next item, 23R4362, resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the auction of surplus commodities and equipment, including ex-fleet vehicles, ex-police vehicles, light and heavy-duty trucks, and miscellaneous, miscellaneous items Utilizing contract number listed with J.J. Kane Exchange LLC and J.J. Kane Associates, Inc. doing business as J.J. Kane Auctioneers. On behalf of the Department of Public Works, Office of Fleet Services, with all revenue generated under the contract to be deposited in the fund account listed herein and for other purposes. Colleagues, we have to amend this to add the surplus inventory list. I'll make that motion and seconded by Bakhtiari. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open.
The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries amended papers before us. Um, Mr. Mason, yeah, you have the floor. And some of us may have questions about the equipment, but go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, city council members. Um, my name is Mike Mason. I'm interim director of DPW Fleet Services. I'm here to answer any questions you guys may have. Um, I know this project is something long overdue for the city. Uh, as far as the opportunity to um, uh, sell uh, surplus vehicles or the revenue uh, stream for the city. And um, welcome any questions. Thank you. All right, questions. We're kind of glancing through the list right here. First of all, how, how do they typically conduct their auctions? I'm, I'm kind of curious and who, are, uh, who is this open and marketed to? Um, they advertise to uh, bring potential people um, Typically, what they do is, is an open auction uh, where the uh, highest bidder uh, will be uh, awarded to whatever piece of equipment or vehicles that um, uh, they bid it on. And then how much do we anticipate we, we get from this proceed-wise? Um, uh, given that list, uh, the vendor gave us a, uh, a low range of um, saying that depending on the, um, uh, the equipment is running and so forth, the low range would be 350000 uh, with a high range uh, upward to 1.2 million. Where, where do those funds go, Mr. CFO, once we receive that, or whoever can answer that? So I It, it, there's a list. There's a table in the legislation. That's okay. I can look at that. Okay. Uh, any other questions for the department? There's a motion. Yeah. Motion from uh, Westmoreland to approve, seconded by Winston. Council. Council Member Shook. Any fire trucks on this list? Uh, yes, sir. There is. And those particular fire trucks, uh, uh, to my knowledge, has been uh, on the surplus yard for a number of years, uh, from my understanding. Yes, sir. Uh, well. And they've been replaced as well within the fleet. From my understanding, uh, speaking with uh, fire department staff, um, the ones that we have at that location, Clear Drive location, were surplus somewhere around 2019, 2020 when uh, the city purchased four uh, new mid-mount units to be placed at various stations. I understand that these units may be well past their life cycle, but under the circumstances where we are apparently down several dozen vehicles, do we need to be giving these away? Well, the question becomes those that have been put in surplus as far as the parts availability. Um, right now, uh, given those um, Again, the conversation I had with um, AFRD staff is that um, uh, those units' parts are probably obsolete and unable to find. And they've been sitting for a number of years, so um, out in the elements, so forth, that they you know, really don't trust the reliability of those units. Okay, but I guess you don't know, or what you're representing is that no one really knows about the viability of these units at this point? Um, to my understanding, uh, based on what I just mentioned, Councilman, is that um, they are in really bad shape and um, it'd be really extensive um, repair costs to even look at that, if you can even locate parts for those units. Well, some hearing may be, and it's logical to assume that and sort of other, other qualifiers and modifiers, but <clears throat> I worry that it could be that some of these units, imperfect as they are, may be better than not having a unit, period. Um, again, that's a good question, Councilman, and uh, I do understand your concern. Uh, again, uh, that's something I can take back to, and uh, with um, AFRD uh, personnel and provide you with an update answer uh, to that question. Okay. Uh, Alex, I'm not interested in you know, waving goodbye to equipment that we're, we, have, we are unconvinced 
um, we have absolutely no use for them. So um, be interested to hear just y'all's thoughts about this. I, I'm not going to support this as it's currently written. Okay, Councilmember Bakhtiari. And I would like Hillis. to go ahead and let Councilmember Hillis go first. Councilmember Hillis and then Bakhtiari. Yeah, so my first question looking through the list was how many old fire trucks are on here and, you know, understanding the position we're in here, I mean, this department has had a functional reserve fleet and I don't know how long. Um, most of what's on this yard that he spoke about or they're all units that are 20 plus years old um, and are just beyond repair and I, my guess would some, the person that's going to have the highest bid is going to be a, uh, in the metal scrapping business. So that's the state of our uh, really non-existent reserve fire fleet. Councilmember Bacteria. Thank you. Um, this question might be a little bit out of your purview, and I understand that this is a, not a shoot the messenger situation, and I, and I do not, and this is not me trying to put this on your shoulders, but I am curious as to if there not a procedure or protocol in place where council is immediately notified of when a vehicle is retired to be sold and then for us to be notified so that we can then make the necessary purchases so we don't get to the point we are in now like is there not a is there a process in place that i'm unaware of um i'm not sure about that councilman uh councilwoman um let me um again let me go back take a look at that um deal with staff along with afrd they probably will be best to answer that question but i can reach out and and provide you with that answer that's mail. I, I would appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, Councilmember Westmoreland. I'm going to make a motion to move forward on condition that we take the fifth week to scrub and see if there's higher apparatus that would be helpful. And if not, we can make, if there is, we can make changes on November 6th. I like that. Second. All right. There's a motion from Westmoreland to approve on condition, uh, condition being um, I, uh, that, yeah, that we um, get a report or assessment from AFRD about whether there is salvageable equipment on this list. Um, I also, to Council Member Bakhtiari's, it would be good to, to do this by department or at least types of equipment um, for that very reason. If we're going to scrap, like most of these are automobiles, which is fine, but if we all of a sudden see that there's a preponderance in automobiles in one department, then we need, we should be having the conversation of replenishment. Um, so I, I think I'm not seeing that logic in terms of how this list is comprised, so maybe having that additional information would be helpful as well. Councilmember Hillis. Yes, I'd also like to see uh, put on that condition that the list, in addition to his modifications, that uh, model years oh, yeah. um, and also where applicable, you know, we're not going to get it on a mower or something that's on there, but uh, mileage if, if they have odometers still. Some, I know a lot of old our old fire equipment's refurbed and doesn't even have odometers on it, so we could get that place. Yes, sir. So two, two conditions. One is kind of the assessment of the fire equipment on here, and the second one is just a recompilation re of this list with the additional information requested. Yes, um, Ms. Robinson. Hi, Amber A. Robinson, City of Atlanta Department of Law. I did just want to address Councilmember Bakhtiari's question concerning the uh, the procedure for determination of surplus supplies, I just wanted to note that it is in the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances, it's Section 2-1332, which sets which uh, concerns the disposition of surplus supplies and says that generally, unless otherwise provided, the Chief Procurement Officer shall dispose of any supplies owned by the city upon recommendation of and after consultation with the user agency. Um, the chief procurement officer shall determine the estimated value of the surplus property to be sold. It provides for guidance or instructions on how such surplus property must be sold. So currently, the code provides that's an administrative determination of the CPO in consultation with the department head. So we're only seeing this because we're, we're it's through a contract for auction services and we have to attach the list. But otherwise, there could be three times this in terms of stuff that is just sold every day or, or disposed of every day, correct? 
So yeah, that's right. Um, the code provides that surplus supplies that have an estimated value in excess of $500 shall be offered through competitive sealed bids in public auction and surplus supplies that have an estimated value of $500 or less may be offered by established markets, posted prices, wow. or by other means advantageous to the city. Okay. All right. Uh, Council Member Bakhtiari. Uh, Ms. Robinson, when you say, could you clarify on department head in that piece? So, um, it's a, I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke. I should have said using agency. Mm -hmm. So that's what is meant by department head. Okay. So like in, in this in case, in fire. this situation of fire, it would be the fire chief. So I believe we have legislation coming up later today that will address some of what we are talking about and I will have questions regarding the the fire chief when we get to that legislation so um, but I believe we have this to vote on thank you but I will note that uh, just for uh, council awareness that any item that's being surplus uh, that particular department as city council just mentioned does sign off on that item to be surplus as well yeah I mean in general I, I, I don't mind the that process, but I do think there may be some class of equipment that it would be good for us to at least know about so that we don't find it. So we're making sure that we are replenishing them at the appropriate rate. But Okay, we have a motion to approve as amended on condition. Uh, any other questions or discussion on that? <coughs> Seeing none, let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved as amended on condition. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, next item, 23R4363, a re resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to exercise the first renewal option for contract number listed, Mythics Oracle Cloud Support with Mythics Inc. on behalf of the Department of Finance for a term of three years effective from November 23, 2023 through November 22nd, 2026, in an amount not to exceed four million six hundred eight thousand six. Whoa, four million six hundred eight thousand six hundred ninety-nine dollars and seven cents, to execute change order number three to convert existing services to universal credit cloud services. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed herein and for other purposes. Ms. Carr. Good afternoon, Yolanda Carr, Deputy CFO. Um, with this um, resolution, we're asking for permission to move forward with the first renewal for Mythics. Mythics is the company that provides the services for Oracle Cloud, which is really the backdoor services for processing payroll. We also have HR, procurement, and all the services with Oracle Cloud for a total of $4.6 for three years. All right, any questions? Motion from Westmoreland to approve, seconded by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. Wait. Did I not? See? The vote is closed. Are you seeing it, Mr. Chair? We're having a problem, but we do see it on the system. You want to? You want to call the vote? Or if you see it, seven, seven yeas. Okay, seven yeas, zero nays. Motion Thank carries. You. Item is approved. Okay, that takes us to dual referred. We do have two that came out favorably from CDHS. The first one is 230 1576, ordinance by Council Member Jason H. Winston as substitute for Community Development and Human Services Committee to amend the FY24 general fund budget to create five trust fund projects under the Department of Labor and Employment Services Support Trust Fund for the purpose of funding signature program initiatives of the mayor related to one, the mayor's youth leadership institute, two, summer youth employment program, three, on the job training, four, ATL quick path, and five, apprenticeship ATL on behalf of the Department of Labor and Employment Services, authorizing the utilization of the funds to pay for expenses related to the city's administration of the mayor's programmatic initiatives through December 31, 2029, authorizing the city to accept donations to support the mayor's program initiatives in an amount not to exceed $750,000.00 through December 31, 2029, to be deposited into the trust fund projects and for other purposes. Again, colleagues, this came out favorable from CDHS. Uh, does the author have anything he would like to add? 
do this. <laughs> there is a motion to approve and this, uh, by Winston, seconded by Bakhtiari. Um, I have, I'm looking at the, the legislation. So while the caption authorizes, I guess, up to 750,000, are we just only committee 30,000 at this point? Is that, am I reading this correctly? Or do, are the tables in the back, should they go up to $750,000? Oh, hi, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm Serena Walker, the Deputy Director of Finance for the newly minted Department of Labor. Yes, at this time, there's only been one donation, and that's in the amount of $30,000 from the Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. And we have structured it so that we can receive more monies as available. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Is, any other discussion? It's been moved and properly seconded. Let's go ahead and open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved. Thank you. Next item, 2301586, an ordinance by Councilmember Michael Julian Bond to amend Ordinance 1901156, which created a consolidated trust fund to provide a permanent funding mechanism for the Atlanta student movement for the purpose of broadening the scope to include other historic individuals, things, and places within the city of Atlanta and for other purposes. This came out favorable out of CDHS. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll make the motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Winston. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item uh, is approved. Okay, we now go to held papers. Um, first item is 46. All right, 23R 4177, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute an agreement for RFP number listed, citywide plumbing repair and maintenance services with Liquid Services and Logistics LLC, doing business as Talon Plumbing on behalf of the De Department of Enterprise Asset Management, Atlanta Police Department, Atlanta Department of Transportation, Department of Aviation, Department of Corrections, Department of Parks and Recreation, Department of Public Works, and the Department of uh, Watershed Management on an as-needed basis for a term of three years with two one-year renewal options in an amount not to exceed $2,103,453.62 annually. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Colleagues, we need to amend this to attach the IPRO, IPRO report. I'll make that motion. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open the vote to amend, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. The amended paper is before us. Um, colleagues, any questions for the department on this paper? Uh, all right, seeing none, is there... Uh, is there a, a motion? Motion from Westmoreland to approve uh, as amended, seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. <coughs> the vote is open. Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved as amended. Uh, next item, we've 50 we've already done. Item 51. All right, 23R, 4261. A resolution by Council Members Hillis, Boone, Collier Overstreet, Juan, Winston, Norwood, Amos, Baxiari, Dozier, uh, Waits, Bond, and Lewis. Submitting an official request to invest Atlanta for tax allocation or TAD district funding from the Perry Bolton TAD in an amount of. Uh, there is an. Uh, thank you. There is a substitute that changes the caption. All right. 4261. Okay. Um, all right. Let me start over. Um, 4261. Council members Hillis, Westmoreland, for Rogue and Shook. Boone, Collier Over Street, Juan, Winston, Norwood, Amos, Bakhtiari, Dozier, Waite, Bond, and Lewis, substituted by Finance Executive Committee, submitting an official request to invest Atlanta for tax allocation or TAD district funding from the Perry Bolton TAD in the amount of $1,925,000.00 to purchase a new Engine 22, a new Engine 28, and a new Battalion Chief 2 vehicle 
to be stationed at Station 22, submitting an official request to Invest Atlanta for TAD district funding from the West Side TAD in an amount of $2,825,000.00 to purchase a new Engine 1, a new Truck 1 tractor drawn aerial, and a new Division Chief 1 vehicle, requesting that upon approval of the applicable TAD and Invest Atlanta boards, that the TAD district funding requested herein uh, a total amount of $4,750,000.00 across the two TADs would be transferred to the City of Atlanta for emergency fleet replacement purchases as described herein on behalf of the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department and for other purposes. I'll make the motion to bring the substitute forward. Second. Seconded by Bakhtiari. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. Thank you. The vote's closed. Six J, zero nays. Motion carries. The substitute is before us. Um, Councilmember Hillis, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chairman Juan. I'm going to save most of my speech for when we get to the ordinance. Um, so what the substitute does, first of all, uh, it is uh, cut out the Beltline TAD uh, having any part of this um, request. Uh, it also reduces the request of the Perry Bolton TAD uh, down $1.5 million and just some other um, kind of polishing of, of the language. Um, so this will be a request of uh, made to invest Atlanta and its respective, the two respective tax allocation district advisory boards, uh, one being the West Side TAD and the other being the Perry Bolton TAD uh, for the uh, apparatus listed, uh, hoping to relieve uh, some of the burden off of the city's general fund and other options we may be looking at. Um, so uh, again, I'll get into more of the issues and details when we get to the ordinance. Uh, but uh, again, this is a simple request of Invest Atlanta to uh, consider this and I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right, there's a motion from Hillis to approve on substitute, seconded by Bakhtiari. Any further discussion on this? Seeing none, let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. This item is approved on substitute. All right, next item. Well, since we're on this topic, let's go ahead and go to your other one, um, which is 2301542. This is an ordinance by council members Hillis, Westmoreland, Faroki, Shook, Boone, Collier, Over Street, Juan, Winston, Norwood, Amos, Bakhtiari, Dozier, Waits, Bond, and Lewis, as substituted by the Finance Executive Committee authorizing the chief financial officer to amend the fiscal year 2024 budget by transferring appropriations from the citywide reserve in an amount not to exceed $10,525,000.00 capital asset fund for Atlanta fire rescue field operations administration vehicles $5,000 or more to purchase 18 is that 18 or 14 right, should be 14 let's make that correction 14 new fire apparatus to include 12 new, well, there it is again. Is that 12 or 7? Seven. Okay. And seven, um, Ms. Linda, if we can make those corrections. Seven new fire engine pumpers, two new tractor drawn aerial fire truck apparatus, and five new battalion division chief for other purposes. Make the motion to bring the substitute forth. Second. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Substitute is before us. Um, so, Ms. Lindo, it's also in the body of the par uh, paper as well. So, let's make those corrections. Councilmember Hillis, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman Juan, again. And first, uh, just to summarize what the substitute does, it um, reduces the amount, um, how it is currently written, that is contemplated coming out of the uh, citywide reserves by six million dollars uh, down to 10.525 uh, from 16 a little over 16 um, and so I'm sure you all were all feverishly tuned into public safety and legal administration committee on Monday so I feel like I may uh, have a broken record for myself but none of you all are on public safety uh, but uh, know of the uh, dire issue that our fire fleet is uh, in right now we currently have it changes day to day, but 17 or so engine and ladders out of service, uh, plus our heavy rescue uh, and its reserve is out of service. They're actually the city side heavy rescues relying on uh, one of the airport rescues 
uh, and then again, uh, multiple pieces of equipment um, are still in service on our streets, uh, but do not have functioning equipment like ladders and nozzles. Um, last check, for example, this uh, fire department has 14 ladder trucks and only two of them uh, are fully operational and on our city streets protecting our citizens and visitors. Uh, the average uh, fleet age is somewhere between eight and nine years old. We have five ladder trucks uh, a decade or older. We have 14 engines a decade or older uh, with three that are 22 years old. They've uh, graduated college. Uh, we have almost zero reserve apparatus, you know, going back to this uh, auction paper we just talked about of surplusing things. You know, a lot of most departments that that have it together, they run a apparatus for eight to 10 years, and then they retire it to our reserve fleet, their reserve fleet. Uh, so they'll have a number of reserve engines, a number of reserve ladder trucks. Uh, this department, uh, other than I believe the um, rescue reserve I mentioned, has almost zero, maybe zero, reserve engines and ladder trucks, um, which is why uh, we are where we are. So we run these things until they are basically dead and can be sold for scrap, and we have not maintained a fleet, a uh, reserve fleet. Um, when I've gathered, we have um, about 20 heavy apparatus, those being engines and trucks that are over 100,000 miles, uh, some approaching 200,000 miles. Uh, since receipt of multiple models, uh, back in 2019, uh, this city has taken a delivery of zero engines uh, and ladders uh, and only placed uh, one engine and one ladder uh, on order that will be de dedicated to the frontline fleet. Uh, so this is going to be the council's answer to almost six years of a total vacuum uh, of any concern or at least aggressive and decisive action on AFRD fleet replacement. Uh, we attempted to do this, uh, I say we, we that are, were on council in 2021, um, during the last year of the previous administration, when we were taken aback that we saw that there were five to six fire apparatus out of service, and we're like, oh, well, we have to do something. And the previous administration, uh, unfortunately and successfully shot that down, and instead uh, had this body uh, adopt a resolution uh, dedicating or saying that we will purchase X amount of vehicles over the next few years and that basically, uh, given that was the last year of that administration, put the onus on the next administration and here we are. Uh, during the same time frame, you know, we have sister cities that we love to compare ourselves to uh, here in the southeast. Um, I use Nashville and Charlotte a lot. Uh, Nashville uh, has placed on order and partially received um, 32 engines and ladders. Uh, Charlotte uh, already has um, 22 plus 20 to 2022 20, models in service and are waiting a receipt uh, of many more. Um, and so to, and, uh, we just passed a paper for requesting TAD funding. Um, I will be at those TAD advisory boards uh, begging and pleading for them to, to answer our call for uh, some help uh, with those funds. Um, so to me, it's not which one of these funding options do we use, it's what can we use and let's use every one of them um, because this is an emergent situation. Um, so to my colleagues, I'm asking uh, for your unwavering and solid support of both the TAD resolution, which we have received, um, or, um, and uh, as it currently stands, the $10.5 million authorization to use fund balance uh, to purchase these direly needed uh, fire apparatus. Um, now, I am all about working uh, with this administration uh, on other options, and we have worked together. Um, myself, uh, Deputy CO Burks, uh, Deputy Chief of Staff Pace, CFO Bala, um, CPO Majumdar, uh, Chief Smith, um, Commissioner Wiggins, 
um, and others uh, have met and we continue to have talks about other options um, and we have an off week coming up so that gives us I believe 11 full days to talk through those options and um, for our, our money man over there to uh, find us some some other options uh, all that said what's passed here today is not a final action um, and these papers at least the one authorizing uh, the fund balance usage um, will likely be further revised before our November 6 council meeting uh, and lastly um, I appreciate Mayor Dickens and his commitment to public service uh, and safety across our city. Uh, he sat in my seat at the public safety chair uh, for a number of years um, before I came on the council in 2018. Uh, so he knows um, the issue uh, that we were facing and I know he is dedicated to fixing it. And I want to thank his leadership team once again um, for working with us on this um, again. If we submitted an order today uh, because of the backlogs at the very absolute best case scenario, nothing's arriving for 18 months, um, likely 24 to 36 months. Um, so in hopes of having more talks, uh, getting more options on the table, uh, really beefing up this fleet because I want to see this entire fleet replaced within the next four years, and then us move to a steady state plan where we are actually buying uh, four engines, Two, two ladder trucks, um, and that does, of course, does not include our specialty equipment, but they'll have to be specialty equipment thrown in uh, each year as well, like our rescues and uh, air trucks, uh, et cetera. Uh, so with uh, respect to having more talks with the administration and more options to pursue, I wanna make a motion to approve, but on condition uh, that myself and perhaps uh, Chairman Juan uh, sat down with the administration over this off week uh, to talk about options, um, other legislation, et cetera, uh, while uh, we work to solve this uh, emerging issue. So I will make that motion and request my colleague's support. All right, there's a motion from Councilmember Hillis. It's been seconded by Councilmember Bakhtiari. Um, Councilmember Bakhtiari, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, let me turn on my mic first. Uh, well, first, CFO, if I can just call you Money Man Bala from now on, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> Um, and I'll put in a change for your nameplate. Uh, but I just want to, <laughs> I just wanted to, um, one, thank Councilmember Hillis for his leadership on this, but also really wanted to commend Nate Bailey and the union for, if, if it wasn't for you all, I don't know how we would have gotten here. I'm, I think something that needs to be named is that we, as council, don't know what we don't know. And the way government should function is that every department is, is fulfilling its, its full duty. We should not be in the position to have to micromanage everything. That's not how things should have to work. And I'm just curious as to where leader, like where fire leadership has been on this, because I don't believe it, it, the chief should be representing this department. And if I, I, I don't know where they are today. I don't know where they are now. We are in a dire position to know how short we are on fleet, to know how short we are on reserves, to know how short we are on everything. And it's because of you and other firefighters that we are aware. And I'm very grateful to you all for making us aware. I'm very grateful for the work that um, that Councilperson Hillis has put into this. I'm very grateful to the administration for wanting to work with us. I'm grateful to HR. I'm grateful for grateful to Money Man over there. I am grateful to each and every person. But the person that has been missing from this conversation, I think now, knowingly for the last three years, has been leadership of this department. And I do not know why continuously when it comes to public safety, fire is treated like the ugly stepchild. It makes no, absolutely no sense to me because of what you all do. The responsibility that you maintain is so great, so much so that the public and even us don't even know everything that you all do. Um, but I am very upset and disappointed that it has come to this and I do not know where leadership has been in communicating these asks and making these asks of us because Chief Cheerbaum does a fantastic job asking for what APD needs, and I'm making the ask here and now on record that leadership and fire do the same, because the entire safety of the city depends on it. And there cannot be a lackluster response or in a hands-off approach when it comes to AFRD. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to invite the administration to speak next. Oh, wait, Councilmember Westmoreland. Okay, I'm going to um, ask, I don't know if, uh, Deputy COO wants to speak first, or I'll turn it over yeah. to UCFO Ball and then 
Thank and then you. I'm going to invite the union to come. Thank up you, Council speak. members. Thank you, Council Member Hillis. And thank you for sitting down with us and really having a deep conversation about what's available out here. I do really want to say one thing for the record um, that since I've been here with this administration, we've deployed over $100 million for the fire department in terms of funding that was in the Renew Atlanta bonds, in terms of funding that, uh, for, that advanced uh, salaries and payments. Uh, for the paying class study to get that behind us in terms of other needs and requests from other financing sources for vehicles that have already been expensed. If you total that in, 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 in <laughs> aggregate, it has been a significant amount. Um, and, uh, you know, work closely with Chief to get a lot of that done and, and, and administration as well. So I want to get that behind us. The other thing, too, is, and, and thank you, Council Member Hillis, was the um, CFO's recommendations to not utilize fund balance. These types of funding requests should rely on continuous funding sources so that you're not relying on funding balance to, to fund balance to, con to continue the city's core needs and operations should always be done with, within the city's uh, general fund and general fund allocations. So we have a capital lease mechanism that's in place. We've been doing that for uh, public safety vehicles. We've been doing that for the take home uh, program and, and the um, uh, city's uh, APD fleet, we will use the same funding mechanism to get these uh, structures in place. So we will have that list and that funding mechanism in place by uh, November uh, 6th. Um, so thank you for passing this, uh, you know, with no recommendation on condition that we get that to you. I'll leave it to CO, uh, Deputy CO Burks to kind of talk about uh, the uh, administration, the chief's need to also vet uh, the needs of, 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 of the fire department and to have a sign off on ultimately what's going to be purchased for the fire department. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Council Chair One and to members of the Finance Executive Committee. LaShondra Burks, Deputy Chief Operating Officer. Just wanted to address a couple of things and also add to what CFO, CFO Bala has mentioned. Um, first and foremost, you know, we always hear the mayor um, give thanks to the women and men of the Atlanta Fire Department as well as the leadership. Um, one of the things that we know for sure, even though we are in this situation and we are working hard to get out of it, is that the thing that makes us, gives us some level of comfort is that we have been able to respond to any and all emergencies that arise throughout the city. And I think that is one important thing to note. We have ordered 11 um, vehicles for Atlanta Fire. Um, we have been given delays by the manufacturer and the company that we ordered from. One of the things that we do know now is that of the 11 that were supposed to be here in July of this year, um, two of them are now currently in the state of Georgia going through some required reviews that will, that will take a little bit of time. And the mayor has charged us to reach out to the manufacturer and the company who we have ordered the vehicles from, even if it means flying to Michigan to sit down and have a meeting about the importance of Atlanta's fire trucks not being put on the back burner um, as we are ordering them and trying to see if we can speed up getting those to us, the remaining of the 11 vehicles that we have ordered. But I can tell you there are some manufacturing issues, but we are working very, very closely to try to get those resolved. I do wanna say that the fire chief reports out to the Public Safety Legal Administration Committee quarterly. And so unfortunately, everybody's not on the same committee. So there are times when you may not hear reports um, from some of the leaders of our departments, depending on which committee you sit on. But we are more than happy to make any of our commissioners and department heads available should any council members ever have questions or need additional information. And I can say that all the things that CFO Bala has spoken about, those are things that Fire Chief um, Smith has been advocating for for us as it relates to the pay and class study, um, also as it relates to the infrastructure bond and really, really helping us to put that list together. So I do wanna say, um, Again, if there is a need for additional information, for a level of comfort, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us, but especially the department heads that are leading that department if you have any questions. 
I would like to ask on behalf of the administration for the paper that is before you, um, if there would be two amendments, one being um, removing that we would use fund balance or reserves for any of this. We've been working with CFO Bala and his team and feel that the administration has a good way forward um, to fund some things for fire department that we want to bring on November 6th that would not include using the fund balance or the reserves. And we would also like, if you would please make an adjustment that the list that is currently there, um, we will have a list based on our fire chief and our operational needs that would be a part of that November 6th legislation. Again, happy to answer any questions that you may have for me, um, but that is the request from the administration at this time. All right, thank you. We received that in the WCO, and we'll discuss that when we're in deliberations. I'm gonna ask if, uh, Mr. Bailey, do you wanna make any comments? And I have a couple questions as well. Thank you all. Afternoon, Nate Bailey, President of Atlanta Professional Firefighters. I just wanna give a backstory um, of our fleet and how we got here. Uh, I talked to a few retired deputies and they gave me the whole history of our fleet. We've been in this situation in 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, and now we're here again. And it's always because the city would buy a bulk of engines or do lease purchase financing. And then near the tail end of that seven to eight years, we would start having you know, engines down with no, no replacement. Um, and so we, we had planned to replace our entire fleet by 2018 and have six of our current engines in reserves. We were buying apparatus every year from 2013 to 2018. But then in 2018, the funding got cut. That led to the pandemic, and that's kind of why we're in this situation. If we would have stayed on that path. I believe four of our current ladder trucks would be reserves, and six of our current engines would be in reserve status. And that would have allowed us to send some of these frontline engines down for longer maintenance, uh, longer preventative care. Because currently, as uh, Councilmember Hill has stated, everything we have is on the road, and it's very hard. It's hard to say no to a citizen when they call 911. If the engine can run, we're going to run it, and we're going to get to the to the scene and take care of them. Um, and that's just a backstory on our fleet. And um, as uh, the CFO was stated, the administration has already spent tens of millions of dollars, uh, you know, not only on fleet but our stations and then the public safety training center. Goes back to our first statement when we met with the new administration. We said we, we kind of need everything and they're putting money towards everything. Um, so uh, we, we need this because we're now hearing it's 36 months. It was 18, now it's 24, and now we're hearing even 36 months to take hold of a new vehicle after we purchase. Um, so, you know, we're saying World Cup ready, and that'll put us right at the World Cup. We can have a, a new fleet, a good dependable fleet. Every station will be open. And as far as those ones that are on the auction yard, our guys would take it, but I'm sure the, the chief, I'm, I'm sure legal would say don't do that because they probably wouldn't pass, you know, a, a pump or aerial test. Uh, I believe those are 2001 ladder trucks. And when those went to, to the auction yard, that's when we had all of our ladders were only four years old. So that was 2018, we'd taken hold of a bunch of new apparatus. But right when they went to auction or to be put on the yard, that's when we stopped purchasing. And that's kind of what put us in this situation. So we definitely need the funding. Um, you know, how the city pays for it, that's not our concern. We know you guys are working on it. We appreciate it. We appreciate the mayor. He's always approachable, reachable. And, and we know that this administration will spend money on public safety. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Mr. Shuck. Are there um, vehicles currently in the shop that we can expedite out of the shop that would help at all? Or do we need to completely buy all new stuff? Thank you, Council Member Shuck. There are some vehicles in the shop that we are working on. Another strategy that we have been able to put in place just um, recently, but we have doubled down on it this week in working with Commissioner Wiggins over at Public Works, is one of the things that we know is that it takes a specially trained technician to work on a fire truck. Okay, that's, it does. It takes a specially trained technician and in many of our instances, we don't have those technicians on our staff. So we have contracted with a company um, who hires technicians who specifically work on fire trucks. Oh, and a hiring blitz. So yes, and so what we're doing is this company will provide technicians. If we feel that things are working well, we have an opportunity to hire those technicians and bring them on with us. 
So we have increased the amount that we are putting towards this outside company to help us continue to identify technicians who can work on fire trucks. And actually just today, there are one, two, three, four engines that Commissioner Wiggins just sent a text about that are being returned back to the fire department today. And so we have made a commitment that this week from Public Works, we would get seven engines back out. And today we released four from Public Works. So we should have the other three remaining released before the end of this week. And that will put us back to a more comfortable space, not the most comfortable, but a more comfortable space in how many vehicles and trucks we have within our fire stations. So that's good. And, but then on a go forward basis, if our fleet is as old as I gather it is, the number of vehicles out of service is going to increase. There will be additional vehicles cycling out of service as we move forward. It happens every day <laughs> in every department, but also in fires. So which is why we are being heavy. As I mentioned earlier, we ordered 11 vehicles that were scheduled to be here in July, um, this past July. And we have been getting some pushback dates because of manufacturing issues. But again, this is where we are willing to fly out and meet with the leadership of the company that manufactures the vehicles that we have already purchased as well as the company that we have purchased them from. Again, two of those 11 are in the state of Georgia now. We just learned this yesterday and going through an inspection process. So we hope to get those two out on the road and into the fire stations very soon. Are three fire stations closed because of this? As of today, no. No fire stations are closed as of today. Part of that is getting the vehicles back from public works out on the back into the fire stations. So I saw a media report saying that three fire stations were closed. So what's the story? So that was the report that Chief Smith made to Public Safety Legal Administration on Monday. Those issues have been resolved since Monday with us returning some fleet back from Public Works. So those are open and operational? Yes. I about fell out of my chair when I saw that being the only person on this panel who survived the closing of a fire station Absolutely. during the, the Great Recession. And I would have hoped that we had all learned our lessons from that. That pain never went away until that station reopened. Um, I get the feeling that the administration is surprised by our intense interest in this. I'm sorry. Are, are, are you surprised that we're intensely interested in this? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Well, how not. come I only heard from the administration just before this meeting via a phone call to attempt to open a dialogue with me or to hear my views on the matter? And I'm not sure, and I apologize for that, um, Council Member Shook. Not sure how it happened that way. But again, most of those, everyone who was at the Public Safety Legal Administration meeting on Monday received an update from Fire Chief Smith. We are happy, and maybe that's one of the things that we should do, is send out the presentation and offer him and his staff the ability to meet with you all when necessary and be more intentional that when we get in situations like that, that we communicate it out to City Council. So y'all don't like the Hillis plan but I have not seen your plan. I've not seen the counter. Yes, I'm not saying that we don't like Councilmember Hill's plan well, because the, the good thing is that- Where's the counter? So the counter is what we agreed to have by November 6th. We are continuing November to work- November 6th of this year. What, yes. why, why the waiting around? So Councilmember Shook, let me, if I can go back. I'm not saying that we do not support, I wanna be very clear, Councilmember Hill's plan. There are two things in council, well, really three things in council member Hillis plan that you're, we are asking that you give us yes, until we, November you've enumerated 16th. them. So I'll yes. let me comment on that. Yes. First of all, every member of council's name's on this paper. That's, yes, how, sir. that's how important this is. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why my name is on it. I'm, I'm hardly known as having an appetite to dig into our rainy day reserves for any reason. I gladly signed on to this because I think there's a huge problem here. I'm trying not to use the word 
scandal or crisis, which I think some may feel entitled to do, because I thought that and only that would get the attention of the administration, and I don't feel I've been proven wrong. So if that needs to stay in order to help facilitate a dialogue, I'd hate to see it taken out, but that's just me. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. All right, Council Member Winston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, first, I want to start off by thanking uh, Council Member Hillis for his leadership on what has become a very dire situation. Um, and I'm going to apologize for not because I'm not on PSLA, and this has already been answered. But how do we get to the 18 um, number of fire apparatus units that are needed? And do we know if this is the ideal number? Do we need more or less? Um, and with the 11 that have already been ordered, plus this potential 18, 29, is that the ideal number that we need for a growing city, or do we have another another number? Council Member Hills, yes. So just speaking to what I've laid out, so I, I stated, in, stated earlier that I would love to see this fleet, entire fleet replaced within four years, um, and then get to a steady state. So for example, the total of this funding between uh, the invest funding and this, again, contemplated right now, reserve funding um, is $15.275 million. Um, and then after this year, it will dip down to around 10, 10.8. Uh, and then it's currently on, even my plan currently is on a five-year replacement plan until it gets to a steady state. And then once you get to a steady state, as stated uh, previously, we could maintain at least our engine and truck fleet, which are the heavy hitters, uh, by purchasing about four engines and two trucks every year. And at least with current numbers, I mean, by the time we get to a steady state, inflation will probably increase this number, but could be done each year for about seven, seven and a half million dollars. Um, but again, this one is basically double that because, and I, I respect uh, CFO Bala's uh, statement and just general practice that you should, you know, fund continual year-over-year -year purchases out of uh, revenues that are coming in year-over-year. -year. However, given the hole we're in, this is contemplated to be front-loaded to dig us first out of this hole and then convert to a steady state where it would be funded uh, year over year. Um, but again, we're here because in no fault of this administration, uh, but we're here as uh, Mr. Bailey stated, this has been an issue decade over decade that rears its ugly head um, every 10 years or so. And you know, here we are. And it also contemplates going to uh, putting an engine and ladder in frontline service for eight to 10 years retiring it to the reserve so we actually have a healthy reserve instead of no reserve. Um, and um, so we don't end up in this situation again. And I, and I guess what I'm really trying to figure out is what's the quantitative number of the hole? Like, what is that? Like, how far in the hole are we when it comes to fire apparatus for the city? Is there a specific number? Do we have, you know, statistics to back that up and what we need, you know, in terms of getting to that ideal number to make sure that, you know, our city is safe? Because ultimately that's what it's about. And, I, and I'll just I'll let, leave with, um, you know, we don't, don't want to replace the entire fleet over a year because that's what, uh, that's what happened, I believe, in 2001, where the initial plan was to replace it over three years and the manufacturer offered them a deal um, where it got replaced over just one to one and a half years. And then 20, 2009, 2010 came up and they were in the situation again. Sure. A little over a decade ago, um, so the you know amount of the entire fleet. I don't I don't know what that number is. Okay. Um, you know, add all these numbers up. But um, most or I've, what I've done with my plan is I've went through, I've gathered the model year and the mileage of all of these engines and and ladders, um, and prioritized them. They're like. Uh, Engine priority one, it's a truck that's not even in service anymore. It's probably one of the ones on the auction block. Um, some of these have 
Uh, engine two has 187,000 miles on it. So the more mileage it has on it, the higher priority it is. Um, this um, plan, um, again, the only thing that's on this paper is the FY24 plan, uh, but it adds um, nine, 11 engines and four trucks. Um, so that's a significant Okay, and then given given this number and whether it's given to the administration, I'm sure we're in collaboration with the CFO, what's the fastest financial mechanism to help us get out of this hole? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and I agree with Council Member Hillis. I think home balance in certain, certain, certain circumstances is a viable source. But because we have an alternative source of funding that's in our deployment and ready to use and utilize right now, Fund balance would be financially responsible to do. We have alternatives that are in place to utilize right now, and we can trigger right now, and we're happy to deploy those needs, those those capital uh, financing uh, mechanisms for the city of Atlanta. They're in place. That program has been working exceptionally well for the city. It's the ideal program for this type of funding. It's the program we utilize for the take-home vehicle policies, and it's also the program we're utilizing for uh, additional equipment that fire has requested for self-containing breathing apparatuses, defibrillators, and other types of equipment needs that are for um, the health and wellness of our firefighters that they want to bring bring into this mechanism as well too. It's deploying. It's it's a it's a program that we're using or we're deploying. So the funding source is is shouldn't be a a, a, a concern here because we have a viable source to to use. Um, that's my recommendation as a CFO. It's it's in place. It's easy to easy to implement and utilize. It's just contingent on a final equipment list. So we want to work with Council Member Hillis, work with administration to get that final equipment list in place. That's going to uh, be attached to that um, uh, capital lease uh, program for the city of Atlanta. Okay, and I, I think you know that would address my concerns. You know, is having a list. And then also finding the, the the fastest financial mechanism to be able to acquire these 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 vehicles, I think is you know is, is what we need. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Burke, did you want to respond to any of the questions that were raised? Yes, just very quickly, if I could, to Councilmember Winston. Thank you for those questions. I do want to say that from um, an operational perspective, our fire chief has, and along with his team have put together a replacement, a multi-year replacement plan list based on our current equipment, where they are assigned to, and we are prepared to share that as well. And so what we are recommending, which is why we ask that we allow the fire department to put together the list of the current purchase is because it would allow us to follow the replacement plan that has been put in place from, a, from an operational perspective. And so that's why I ask that we um, say that the list that's currently attached, in which our chief and his team have reviewed because we received it from Councilmember Hillis during a meeting and we offered some feedback on some of that. So that's why we're asking that we include language that the fire chief will, pre will present the recommended list for the funding that Councilmember, um, that CFO Bala has mentioned the new funding mechanism that we can use instead of reserves. All right, Councilmember Hillis. Uh, thank you, um, colleagues and Ms. Burks. Um, I'll just state that, you know, as I did and did earlier, I'm, I'm open to your, your suggestions, but th that is why I made the, con the motion to approve on condition that we continue these discussions and, and mold this legislation as to uh, how uh, finance and fire, uh, public works, et cetera, uh, need it to be. Uh, and contemplate other legislation that the CFO has, has spoken about. Um, so we, I think we've all said what we need to say, but my, I guess, last just question is, um, and you, I, I think you would know this, but has Mayor Dickens had a, uh, I guess, a come to Jesus sit down meeting with Chief Smith about why we're here, where's the plan, what what's, What's going on? Is the coffee brewing? Has, has the mayor had that meeting with Chief Smith? Well, I mean, I think that's a personnel discussion, and I'm not sure about the term come to Jesus meeting, but um, we have had consistent meetings with Chief Smith, all of our chiefs, and all of our commissioners, 
and department heads around the needs that they have in their departments. And so one of the things that we currently have from Chief Smith now is the replacement plan, a multi-year replacement plan, which um, we support um, as has been provided by us again, which is why we're asking for that adjustment in the meeting. But we can we have ongoing meetings with all of our chiefs and department heads. So we feel like we are in we have a good plan in place um, for the replacement of vehicles for fire. Thank you very much. Um, I want to piggyback on that one a little bit because I do think it is important that we don't 10 years down the road find ourselves in the situation or whoever is sitting up here find ourselves in the situation again. And I, I do think this is one of those where we have to be careful not to kick the can down the road and think that, oh, the next folks are going to take care of it so we don't have to mess with it because we find our, you know, that's how we end up here, to be honest with you. Um, it's this kind of, um, this unwillingness to bite the bullet and, and, and make the hard decision and make the hard investment. So I, I do hope those conversations are going. I, I do hope that perhaps as council members, we figure out a way that we can also better follow this um, so that it doesn't hit uh, the status before we react the way we do. Um, I will also say that I, I'm, while I appreciate the request, I will just go around. I'd, I'd like moving the paper forward the way it is because it, it, it sets that stake in the ground that we have to move off of um, and then puts just a little extra pressure on y'all to come up with uh, the plan. And, um, not that I don't think y'all would, but I just think that it signals to us, from us, to y'all and to the public uh, that you know, this is how serious we are. I mean, we've identified a, sort, a fallback source of funding um, so that come November 6th, you know, this is where we move from. The last thing I want to ask, I mean, obviously we've been fielding a lot of questions and concerns and, um, from our constituents and from the public, rightfully so. This is a serious situation. What I've heard from you today in terms of how we can now respond to them, first off, it sounds like, number one, um, the three stations that were closed are now open again. So all our stations are, are, are back open as a first response. Second, you mentioned that seven um, vehicles are, uh, we've gotten some out, but by the end of the week, we'll have seven out of fleet in service again. We've got 11 on order, two of which are in the state. The other nine, y'all are gonna put pressure on the manufacturer to get sooner rather than later. And then this paper adds um, another complement, a significant complement of vehicles. Um, now, the concern I have is the 11, let's say nine, the two are in the state, let's assume we can get them soon, but the nine plus these have a long lead time. So what do we tell our constituents in that period where it could be 18 months to 36 months? Um, you know, what's our strategy? What's our plan? And so I think our strategy and plan, there are a couple of different strategies and plans. One is we feel confident if we can get these 11 in, we will definitely be in a much okay. better situation than we are in now. Um, that's number one. Number two is the extra support that we are providing to our fleet services division okay. um, around staffing up on and getting those package. out of service. Okay. And what we have also done is authorized any amount of overtime that may be required to do that. So in many instances, some of the fire trucks come in over the weekend, you know, and then they may not be seen until, or start working on until Monday. So we have authorized weekend overtime. So we've made some adjustments on how we keep our emergency vehicles on the street as best and in the fire stations as best as we possibly can. But we are, so we feel confident if we can get these 11 in, the strategies that we have put in place for um, our fleet services division that we will be in a much better space. And we are continuing to have conversations even as we started having conversations around what FY25 could look like. The mayor was very clear that there should be funding in every budget as long as he's here to finance additional vehicles and work through this replacement plan that we have from our fire chief. Okay, thanks. And I, and I appreciate the fact that you said that uh, um, that practice will also extend to other departments too. So yes. I mean, we don't want to turn around and all of a sudden Public Works has got a, f a fleet crisis Absolutely. that we have to um, jump to. So, okay, I appreciate that. Council Member Hillis. Just um, one more request that there be and you have been great. You answered my calls and my texts, everything about this and many other issues. But 
that there's be more communication from the fire department, whether that comes from the chief or assistant chief, deputy chief, whoever, about the status of each of our council districts. Because coming into the public safety meeting Monday, I had no idea that two of my stations were closed. And then after that, I came to the realization, and I, again, appreciate the need to strategize and move equipment around, but there were four adjoining territories in Northwest Atlanta where two of the stations were closed. One was staffed only with a battalion chief F-250, which can't fight a fire. And then another engine or another station outside of my district, but having some first response territory in District 9, um, it's staffed with a ladder that doesn't operate and, of course, doesn't have a tank and can't pump water. Um, so just ask that those that information be communicated. I've still not received a reply on, on that request. I mean, I know I've been by at least one of the, one of the stations that was previously closed and know that it's open. Um, and, you know, it was stated that those other two have been opened as well, but we'll just like a, I don't know if this council wants a daily report if, you know, one of their stations is either closed or if it has no firefighting capacity. Um, you know, I know most of their calls are medical calls. Um, but, you know, when, when a fire does happen, you know, that we need that um, firefighting capability and definitely don't want to see uh, more than, you know, one, adjoining, one, one or two adjoining territories not having any firefighter equipment in that territory. Um, and just some further details about the equipment that's on order. Uh, you know, as I stated, only one engine and one ladder uh, out of that is going to the frontline fleet. One will be a new uh, engine at the new engine or station 36, I believe in Councilman Rover Street's district. Is that right? 36? 36. 36. Uh, that will and be 37. Going to, 36 and 37. Yeah. Um, and a, uh, the TDA, I believe, will be going to station 11, Atlantic Station. Uh, but the rest will be going to the reserve fleet. And like I said, we need a reserve fleet. But I have concerns even about those orders. Um, the the quote-unquote ladder trucks that are on that order are basically utility trucks that don't have ladders, so they also can't fight fires like the, the trucks they're getting moved to um, fill in for. And even the engines, um, it's come to my attention that they were ordered, I believe, absent any equipment. Um, so, you know, for example, one of the things that Firefighters need in their engines. Um, they have very heavy, I was mentioned the SCBAs, the breathing apparatus that they wear. They have to have places to hang those. Um, I believe those were ordered without any, any of that type of equipment on them. Um, and I know they're going to reserves, but even when a reserve truck is put in the fleet, then um, you know, it's got to be able to function for, for our firefighters. So that's just something I would ask you to look into, especially for those engines. I know the purpose of the Utility trucks is to get something fast and, you know, function as a reserve. Uh, just won't have a ladder. Uh, but if you could, number one, the communication part uh, from the chief or his staff, and then two, uh, just some details on uh, how capable those uh, others, those, I guess, nine others uh, that are going to the reserves will, will be when they have to get deployed. For sure. And we will work on a communications plan. I actually heard Chief Sherbaum say on Monday that every time there's a homicide in one of your districts, not sure how that works for at large, but every time there's a homicide in one of our 12 specific districts, he makes a call. And we can, so we will work together to put together a communications plan on how we communicate when we are in those types of situations. I did learn this week that there is a difference between closed and brownout. Um, of course, those are fire terminology. So for me as a regular citizen, as I'm sure for most other people, closed feels like really closed when it really is not. Um, so we will make sure that we do a better job too of communicating out what closed really means because it has to be closed for so many hours before it's considered technically closed. Um, and then how we keep battalion chiefs and a firefighter in a fire station, even if there are not engines there. So if in the event it needs to be used as a safe space, um, we can still do that. So we will work on a level of communication strategy 
um, with council so that as things happen in your districts, that we are intentional about reaching out and especially when we get to what we define as closed. Thank you. Uh, council member Collier Overstreet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Councilmember Bond forgot that I'm, you know, engaged and very important. <laughs> um, I do have a couple questions, you know, very basic, uh, but we keep talking about the fact that we were due fire trucks in um, July and it's November and we don't have them. And my thought is, what is our recourse? And what's the name of that company? Let's shout it out. And, um, you know, what, what is our timeline? You know, like what, what is the next measure if it takes too much longer, if we're not getting, you know, you said two are in Georgia, you know, which is right. Two out of eleven not a good, is not good. No, two out of eleven. Yeah. Is so not good. I, I just want to know, you know, what's our plan with, with them not delivering to the city when they're supposed to, and who is it? So very good. It's, it's under they're under city contract. So we order our fire trucks through Peach State. Um, who uses Spartan as the manufacturer. Um, so there are some manufacturing issues that we understand, which is why we would like to meet with both Peach State, Peach State and Spartan, even though they are the manufacturer, is what we have been challenged to do. But I can also tell you that we have had conversations with our chief procurement officer around readily identifying other companies that we can order fire trucks from. Um, I don't think it will change the you know 30 to 36 month delivery time that's just what it takes nationwide to build these types of vehicles but at least we want we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket again like we did these 11 we ordered all 11 from the same company so we want to be a little more strategic about the list that we're bringing to you on november 6 um, to make sure that we're not ordering all from the same company and we're able to do a little bit better strategy around our ordering Okay, um, so, you know, just like outside of the city, if you are do something and you're, you're not getting it, we have to do more than just be understanding. So I just want to know, we've not met with them yet about this. We just are accepting the fact that they're saying they're having manufacturing problems. So we have had our... Our operations chief within the fire department has had weekly conversations with the vendor okay. um, as we continue to get the pushbacks, um, which is why we feel like at this point it has escalated where the mayor would like to be involved as well as senior leadership around these meetings um, so that we can let them know just how serious we are. And we do have a process in procurement where we officially file vendor complaints so that we're on the record and the fire department has taken the opportunity to complete that appropriate paperwork around filing a vendor complaint about consistently being pushed back. Okay, well that's what I, I heard what I needed to hear. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. All right, any other discussion? We have a motion that's been properly seconded. It is to approve on, uh, on condition, um, and it's been properly seconded. Any further discussion on that motion? All right, with that, we'll go ahead and open the vote, please. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. This item is approved on condition. All right, we have one paper left. We're going to end with a softball here. 22R4268 is a resolution by Councilmember Alex Wan, as substituted by Finance Executive Committee, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to refund customers for overpayments to water and sewer accounts in an amount of $10,714.36. All funds to be charged to and paid from fund department organization and account numbers listed. And for other purposes, I'll move to bring the substitute forth. Seconded by Shook. 
substitute just adds the actual amount uh, for um, yeah, for the paper. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeays, zero nays. Motion carries. Substitutes for us. Uh, Shook has made the motion to approve on substitute. I'll second it. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Item is approved on substitute. That concludes our, our legislative work. Just have a reminder that this there is a fifth week in October, so no council meetings next week. Um, our regularly scheduled programming will begin back on November 6th with full council, uh, committee chairs, committee on council, and then the full council meeting. Any other announcements? <laughs> All right, with that, we stand adjourned. Thanks.